the Univaz uh, audio server. From henceforth, we will be a YouTube exclusive. And the yeah. pretty little... soon we'll be raking in the money, DJ. Univaz exactly. And now that I can server. hear an echo, I know that we are live on the stream. So uh, we'll give this uh, maybe a minute or two more because I do understand that uh, Hubby might be trying to make his way in. So okay. let's uh, see if he makes it. Yeah, we can give it a couple minutes. Let's see. So it was uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, today. We'll uh, talk a little bit about that in a, a minute or two. Um, you know, I, I do think that it maybe have got almost to 50 out today. Uh, yeah, it was nice. I think, I don't know now. Uh, it was a busy day for me and I was inside mostly. But was, was there sun? Did the sun come out? <laughs> well, um, I'm just thankful that um, sunrise seems to be earlier. Mm -hmm. and, oh, it is. You know, sunset is a little later. I don't know that the day is necessarily longer, but I feel like I'm seeing a little bit more sun. And yeah, every, every day it's about five minutes, three minutes longer. And pretty soon I'll actually be able to resume my uh good old morning walks i'm excited yeah let's see i'm just checking to see if he's going to join us in the chat room sometimes he has difficulty getting in and well you know sometimes people don't uh pay attention to the hour of the day and they just call just like when you were a kid remember your folks probably said it's not polite to call people after dinner <clears throat> yep, that's right that was not considered good or, or what during dinner the dinner hour you, that was very rude to call people mm -hmm. and back when hour. back when we used to be concerned about long distance uh what was it is it nine o'clock or is it eight o'clock i think is when they said that the peak calling hours were and you got to have cheaper long distance <laughs> yeah i think i, I can't I, maybe after nine somewhere you want to know something else i heard that i heard this today hmm. um it used to be when we just had maybe one telephone, one landline, a house, no such thing as um, cell phones or nothing. When you called, you weren't necessarily going to reach the person you wanted to talk to. And you mm -hmm. would have to say, hello, this is blah, blah, blah. May I speak to blah, blah, blah. You didn't necessarily get the person you were calling. <laughs> so that doesn't happen anymore. You, you call and you expect the person you're calling to answer the phone because it's their phone. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I'm i going to take a page out of uh, a listener's book here. Uh, I, I understand that Kathy Bacon's nickname for you is Stink Pot. And uh, I remember my grandmother used to use that as a term of endearment when someone was being difficult. Um, but I remember being a little stink pot as a kid because we didn't have any of those fancy features on our phone like call waiting yet. Oh, and no. I used to call the operator and pretend it was an emergency if I couldn't oh. get through to one of my classmates. <laughs> oh, you little. Beep, oh. beep, beep. <laughs> You, you were a stink pot. <laughs> I never dared do anything like that. I don't think oh. that. I don't think that never even occurred to me. <laughs> well, sir, I think it's a few minutes in. So shall we? Uh, you know, uh, grease the wheels. Yeah, we better start. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to the beautiful historical marionette theater. This evening, we're going to be visiting a comedy drama from the early 70s, and it takes place on an Ivy League college campus, Boy Meets Girl, and a little turmoil ensues. Please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Why, good evening, Mr. Smelly. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, sir. Uh, top of the evening to you, as yeah. they say. 
Well, did you did you have yourself some uh, colored libation there? Did you have yourself a shamrock shake today? No, I didn't. But um, I did make some uh, cabbage and corned beef and took some over to my parents. I, I have some for myself, but I didn't haven't eaten it yet. Um, but uh, everything looked nice and tender. Mm. Uh, I had my own version of that. I didn't have cabbage per se, but I did have Brussels sprouts and they're kind of like tiny cabbages. Oh, they're in the cabbage <laughs> family. They're cruciferous veggies. I, I This was my week in the office and uh, I was told that the boss is not fond of the smell of cooked cabbage. So uh, that put the kibosh on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Brussels sprouts will, will, will smell up just like cabbage. Mm. Yeah, I, I actually did do that once I, i've never forgotten it because i don't know i i just was never aware that they were so pungent and i had brought some leftover brussels sprouts and i you know at that time duh everyone ate at their desk and didn't mm -hmm. stop working duh um which is illegal um, you have to have a break, but nobody, you know, this was a place where you, you didn't get a break and we just worked and worked. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I opened that, I opened those Brussels sprouts and everyone <laughs> turned and looked at me. <laughs> what is that? Oh. I had no idea it was going to smell up the room like that. Oh, my. Well, I guess your co-workers had a different nickname for you than Kathy Bacon. Does. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, St. Patrick's Day, Toppy, apparently this March, uh, I mean, March in general, is actually Irish American History Month here in the U.S. of A's. So All right. uh, I thought I'd just give you a quick run through some important dates in Irish history. Oh, cool. OK. Um, so these are things you might not know if you're not like myself of Irish descent. In 1800, the Irish Parliament. Yeah, star, star Sage is an old Irish name. Folks. It sure <laughs> is. It's just uh, right there in the ground like <clears throat> potatoes. <clears throat> um, so, you know, it's quite a while ago now. But if you think about it, this was the turn of the century in 1900. Well, 19th century. So in 1800, the Irish Parliament, which was the governing body, kind of like a Congress, it was abolished by the United Kingdom. Whoops. The Queen of England, or actually, I think it was the king at the time, basically said, no, no, you don't get to have your own government. You are a occupied people. The Irish people were not allowed to elect their own people to public office from 1800 forward. It wouldn't be until 1920, 120 years of occupation. Wow. The government of Ireland bill created the state of Northern Ireland, uh, which consists of six counties, and the Republic of Ireland, which represents the Southern counties, was organized in 1920. So we're just looking at a little over a century now since the Irish people got their independence. Now, although an underground Irish Republican army would officially exist for more than 50 years afterwards, after that 1920 period, there were British military checkpoints on main border crossings and UK security forces made the remaining crossings impassable. But by 2005, in phase with the implementation of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, the last remaining controls were definitively removed. On a side note, for some a more Irish American uh, history, in fact, more historical fiction, see our February 2020 name minutiae episode about Scarlet, the CBS miniseries starring Joanne Wally and Timothy Dalton. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my wish that before these people die, I would like those who were involved in basically stopping the violence, uh, a ceasefire, the because uh, it used to there used to be a lot of violence and bombings, especially that was a thing, and terrorism. Uh, in in Ireland and uh, in, in in the UK, um, and it stopped, and and these were people with serious issues against each other, you know that you that went on for generations. Well, these people need to go 
uh, to other places in the world. Uh, I don't know, Israel, Palestine, and show them how to fucking get over it and uh, make peace. Mm-hmm. So anyways, that's my one. And uh, just another quick aside, many of you may have heard of the infamous Irish potato famine. Well, it would not have caused the total decimation of the Irish people if it weren't for the fact that the Irish were only allowed to eat potatoes (laughs) because the occupied forces of the crown took all the crops and livestock that were grown by farmers who were basically tenants. Their ancestral lands were governed by the crown. They paid taxes on their own land, didn't get to vote, and basically starved because the only thing they were left were the potatoes that were rotting in their fields because there was a particular fungus that they didn't have the uh, the science to fight then. So uh, that was the 1890s. So Yeah, that and that caused... Uh, tremendous amount of people fleeing those that didn't die and those who were strong enough got on boats came to america um where guess what Mm. Uh, they were discriminated against of course Uh, of course but without irish americans we wouldn't have the parts of the railroad in the northeast and uh, the erie canal which is right here in my backyard and Speaking of looking up your old address and uh, backyards, I do hear that our senior showgirl is wearing something green and shimmery. Ooh, where are you, madam? La, 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 la. Here I am. What do you think? Ooh, that's pretty snazzy. These are green sequins. Can't Mm. you tell? (laughs) Uh, And my green boa. Oh, listen. This is an old suit. I mean, I wore this back in the day when I was popping balloons over my butt. Anyway, and um, anyway, so I, it's it's kept fairly well, a um, little tight. You know, even though you're wearing green, I do hear you got pinched at the bus stop. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Mm, uh, well, yeah. Well, Madame, could you get downstairs here? Uh, we got a show to start and, uh, you know, we, we, we need to get snappy. Okay. Uh, green beer at intermission. <laughs> okay, bye. All right, here we go. Young James Hart is a first year law student at an Ivy League school. Like many, he's struggling to balance his studies and a social life. To complicate matters further, he falls for the one girl who could both make his life interesting and difficult. Will James get along with his study group? Will he make the grade? He's playing with fire. Grab a bow tie and some textbooks. It's time for The Paper Chase with Timothy Bottoms, Lindsay Wagner, and John Houseman. Take it away, fellas. What do you get when you take a dash to the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies and a smidgen of streaming. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. Well, we're back at the 70s. We're on an Ivy League campus in this story, Toppy. Yeah. Yeah, they say right at the start, there's no uh, playing around with where we're at. We're at Harvard. Yeah. And, you know, um, before you grab your box of Kleenex, because there's some 70s jazz flute in there, and you have to wonder if someone's going to be left, uh, you know, wondering um we're gonna take a peek at what would have played if you were a moviegoer back then to uh tease you what was coming this is a little bit long but that's the way they did things back then okay harvard law school cambridge massachusetts since its founding in 1870 it has produced 75 united states senators 
200 congressmen, 11 Supreme Court justices, and an undetermined number of dropouts and breakdowns. That's just a screamer, man. Screams every Friday and Sunday night at exactly 12. This is James T. Hart, class of 76. He has a birth certificate, a driver's license, a high school diploma, a draft card, a college degree, and he's about to spend three more years of his life chasing another piece of paper. Loudly, Mr. Hart. Fill this room with your intelligence. I haven't read the case. 20th Century Fox presents The Paper Chase. All that stuff about grades is true. You gotta work like hell. We use the Socratic method here. They're just grades, Kevin. You come in here with a skull full of mush. It's a number, it's a letter, but it determines salaries and futures. Professor Kingsfield? Yes? You wanna get drunk? That is the most intelligent thing you've said today. There's no guarantee that we're all going to be here in the spring. Some of us might have nervous breakdowns. One more word out of you, Anderson, and I'll lock your head in your attache case. What did you say? The paper chase. Every guy in this house almost flunked out the first year. It's not too hard to see why. They had broads on the brain. Oh, do you mind? There's someone following me. Just to the corners, all right. I'll walk you home. I'm telling you, Hart, the worst thing a law student can do is get involved with a girl. I haven't been working hard enough since I've been seeing so much of you. And it's all my fault, is that what you're saying? Why didn't you tell me you were Kingsfield's daughter? Our relationship has changed. It certainly has. <laughs> I feel like an intruder. Not in his bed, but in his study. Oh my God, he's back. Is he getting out of the kitchen? So what did he say? Well, he just said he hoped it wasn't a law student. The paper chase. I found something. There's a room above the stacks where they keep all of the actual notes the professors took when they were law students here. I want to see the notes. I want to see Kingsfield's notes on contracts. I shall be irrational. <laughs> Panic has descended. Oh my God! What have you been doing in this room? Oh, you may flunk me! Huh? Here's a dime. Call your mother to have a serious doubt about your becoming a lawyer. Look, he's got you scared to death. Oh, you're going to pass because you're the kind the law school wants. You'll get your little diploma, your piece of paper that's no different than this, and you can stick it in your silver box with all the other paper in your life. You are a son of a... Ooh, 1973, Toppy. Yeah, a long time ago. Uh, why don't you tell us what was going on in the U.S. history? U.S. history in 1973. Well, back then, Elvis, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley's concert in Hawaii was the first worldwide telecast by an entertainer watched by more people than the Apollo moon landings. Whoa. Yeah. That was way before MTV. President Richard Nixon, Tricky Dick, announced suspend, the suspension of offensive action in North Vietnam. Right, because it wasn't a war. <laughs> right. U.S. involvement ends and prisoners of war are released and someone takes credit that probably didn't deserve it. But hey, that's history. The U.S. Supreme Court overturned state bans on abortion, Roe versus Wade. <laughs> wasn't that just a few days ago <laughs> uh, oh wait we reversed it <sighs> progress anyone the first handheld cellular phone is made by martin cooper nope no nope, no nope. <clears throat> read that again the first handheld cellular phone call call, call is made by Martin Cooper in New York City. So they had to have had the phone by then. Yeah, yeah, they uh, had it. But I guess he's Martin Cooper, whoever he was in New York City, actually made the first handheld cellular phone call. Mm. That, that's trivia for you. Oh, right. And, you know, we called it handheld, but the truth was that it probably fit in a briefcase because yeah. they had bag phones back then. The World Trade Center officially opened in New York City with a ribbon-cutting ceremony. Oh, uh. And the American Psychiatric Association finally, after Stonewall, removed homosexuality from its uh, doctrine, I believe is the All best right. way to say that. Uh, before we go, I just want to test my mic. Tommy says, I'm not hearing me well. 
He says so that you're low. Yeah, I'm going to try to move closer. I don't know if there's anything you can do. <clears throat> um, there's nothing more I can do here. That's okay. It'll be louder when we're done. So, Toppy, in 73, we had a few people that came into this world that were no longer just a twinkle in the eye and would be making headlines today. Who were those celebrities born in 73? All right, everybody's favorite, Neil Patrick Harris. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Juliet Lewis. Mm -hmm. Kristen Wiig. You know, she's from that Rochester area, I hear. Oh, didn't know that. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, also, Dave Chappelle was born in 73, and so was Mario Lopez. Oh, yes, that guy who's basically like... Um, Oh, uh, who is the king of Christmas music? He, this this guy's the king of Lifetime movies, basically. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, in '73, um, what what other movies were playing at the box office? Oh, righty. And uh, where does our movie place? Okay, so the Paper Chase. It was a film. It was on the silver screen. You had to go and leave your house to see it, folks. Back in October of 73 is when it came out now. Of course, we have a soft spot for the underdog here. Uh, the films that were at the top of the box office, though, that was, uh, you know, taking everybody's money, out of the mouths out of babes. Uh, <laughs> number one that year was The Exorcist. Lots of pea soup, folks. Uh, brought in 193 million. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that made the rounds shocked the hell out of everybody. And, and, and people like to be shocked and scared. Mm -hmm. And it uh, brought us Alan Burstyn and Max von Sydow in those roles. Number two that year, bringing it up to the second rung, 159 million was The Sting, which starred Paul Newman and Robert Redford. And uh, number three, that was, their, that was their second big team up. Ah, and number three was American Graffiti, bringing in 115 million with Richard Dreyfus and uh, the future star of Happy Days, Mr. Ron Howard. Mm -hmm. And uh, American Graffiti is what that their George Lucas was doing yeah. uh, before he started thinking about Star Wars. Oh, so he. Uh, he broke in his check writing pen with uh, American Graffiti. Mm. Well, that was one of them. He had another one. <clears throat> um, it's a bunch of numbers. I can't remember. XT31 something or other. Oh, Anyways. T oh, THX 1138? Yeah, it's it. Oh, oh, that is a cult classic. We'll need to discuss that one someday. Yeah. I have it on Blu-ray, don't you know? Yeah, that, was oh. his, that was his Lucas's first movie oh, that's a weird one that makes more sense now <laughs> one better than uh we'd like to say the paper chase probably at least got to the middle of the box office that year one better than the paper chase bringing in 62.8 million was a film called cinderella liberty which starred james Kahn and one of my favorite leading ladies marcia mason and uh just Below the middle of the box office for the year was a film that brought in 62.5 million. The Seven Ups, which starred the star of the Jaws films, Roy Scheider. And uh, I am sorry, I'm not sure what this person has done before, but uh, Tony Lobianco was his co star in The Seven Ups. And I don't think it was about the soda pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> am I crazier? Was Lo Bianco uh, also a name involved in the Sharon Tate? Was isn't it usually called the Tate Lo Bianco murders? Anyways, oh, I don't probably, know. I, I to 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 quote uh, the pot is my co-pilot, folks. You probably are not wrong on that. Maybe so, I don't. So the paper chase it made looks like sixty two point seven million, which is nothing to. I mean, it was a critical success for sure, but, uh, you know, I mean, there were so many other movies to see. I mean, think of that year, Exorcist, American Graffiti, uh, The Sting. Those were three incredibly popular movies. 
Mm -hmm. So Toppy, there is a boatload of talent that came together to make this film. Tell us a little bit about the director, the person James, behind yeah. the camera. Yep, James Bridges. At first I thought, well, you know, this is one of the Bridges boys. Uh, you know, Jeff Bridges, his brother, and his other brother. <laughs> Uh, all sons of Lloyd Bridges, the uh, actor. Well, no, he's got nothing to do with them. Uh, uh, but he was an American screenwriter, a film director, producer, and actor. Um, he's a two-time Oscar nominee. Uh, he was uh, nominated for Best Original Screenplay for The China Syndrome. That's a movie I'd like to do here yeah. sometime. And once uh, for Best Adapted Screenplay for the paper chase and the paper chase was based on a 1970 novel by john j osborne jr uh, bridges was born in 36 in little rock arkansas but he grew up in paris arkansas now get this his life partner from 1958 until his death um was oops i just lost my place uh da -da 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 -da, uh was um an actor, a librettist, a screenwriter and producer. His name was Jack Larson. So uh, they had a very, very long life together. Uh, Bridges got a start as a writer for television in 1963 uh, when he wrote 16, count them, 16 episodes of Albert Hitchcock Presents from 63 to 65. And uh, one of his episodes called An Unlocked Win uh, Window earned him a 66 Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America for Best Episode of TV Series. Uh, he went on, <clears throat> Bridges went on to write and direct a number of notable films, including The Baby Maker, The Paper Chase, a movie called September 30, 1955, The China Syndrome, Urban Cowboy, Mike's Murder, Perfect, and Bright lights big city in 1978 five years after the paper chase movie premiered bridges returned to television to create the tv series the paper chase which was based on the original novel and the movie and uh, for which he wrote two episodes 22 episodes were produced for and aired on cbs television and it starred James Stevens taking over as the main protagonist, Jonathan Hart, and with John Hausman reprising his role as Professor Kingsfield. Despite extensive critical praise, ratings were low, and CBS yanked it after 22 episodes. It was uh, those 22 episodes were subsequently rebroadcast on PBS, where a whole new audience saw it. And um, it was quite uh, popular. And so that made Showtime think, you know what? This is good stuff. We're going to save it. So in 1983, uh, uh, Showtime brought the show back with both Hausman and Stevens for 37 additional episodes. That's pretty unusual. Mm. And you'll, you'll be glad to know at the end of the fourth and final season, James Hart uh finally graduates from law school <laughs> oh. um bridges died in 1993 at the age of 57 too young from cancer oh so i have a challenge for the chat room for those of you listening tell me if you can find out if the series of the paper chase was ever released on home video we'll uh check back in with you in a little bit here all right, so before we step over to the snack bar, because I hear Gertie jingle jangling over there, um, we're going to talk about the first member of the cast. So this is not an adult film star. No. <laughs> I had to ask. I hope that this is his legal name because I would not have chosen it if I was picking a stage name. Timothy bottoms but i'm bum played james t hart he was the freshman college boy in this story now, uh, mr bottoms was born in santa barbara california you know that place they set some of the of those popular soap operas 
His second film appearance, his only his second film appearance, was in the last picture show just a couple of years before with Jeff Bridges in Sybil Shepherd. Now, this was alongside his actor brother, Sam. Sam Bottoms. Yes. <laughs> oh, it was a traveling road show, I'm sure. The Paper Chase was Timothy Bottoms' fifth film. The one, two, three, four, five. Five. He was his fifth one. This film before the paper chase was called Love and Pain and the World Damn Thing. I think it's the whole damn thing with Maggie Smith, which I do believe he's going to talk about shortly in our intermission. Now, the film after this was called The White Dawn, starring Warren Oates and uh, the future star of the. Um, Iron Eagle movies of the 80s, Lewis Gossett Jr. Bottoms would appear in seven films over the next five years following the paper chase, including The Crazy World of Julius Vruder, V like Victor, R O O D E R, in 74, Operation Daybreak in 75, A Small Town in Texas in 76, and Roller Coaster in 77. And then in 79, he was in a film called Hurricane, 86, Invaders from Mars, and more recently in 2003, a film called Elephant. In all between 71 and the current, Timothy Bottoms has been in over 75 movies. Most recently, he appeared in a film in 2020 called Char. It was about a... uh, uh, sort of a Jurassic Park adventure in the La Brea tar pits. Okay. Am I crazy? Wasn't there a movie released this year that got a lot of Oscar buzz called Tar? Um, let's see. Tar. 2023. No, there was a film called uh, Tar in 2022. And it's uh, it's okay. an international doesn't... world of Western classical. Okay, doesn't, interesting. Doesn't but maybe it was Taz. I don't know. Anyway, that's okay. Similarities here. All right. So I hear that jingle jangling. We're gonna step on over here to the snack bar, where Miss Gertie is uh, doing her best attempt at river dance while trying to not spill her drinks. And uh, we're going to listen in on an interview with our favorite Dallas Morning News host, Bobby Wyant. And this is an interview from 1973 with the Paper Chase star, Timothy Bottoms. In 1972, Timothy, I went on record as saying that my favorite picture, my best picture of the whole year was Sleuth. And then I'm saying now on the record that my favorite picture of 1973 is The Paper Chase. It starred you with John Houseman. And John Houseman now has a Golden Globe for supporting actor. Yes, John will probably uh, be nominated for Academy. Yes. Did you know him before you were in Paper Chase? Yes, I did. When I was 18, I had the opportunity to meet John. Uh, some of my friends auditioned for his school. I was going to audition for his school and I was given a job. Johnny got his gun, never went. However, four years later, I made a film with him. <laughs> Did he remember you? Yes, yes, he remembered me. He knows uh, my friend, Sam Chuchavis, who is one of his special students there from Santa Barbara. We were aware of, we had many friends in common, theater friends. John is a, a theater Yes, that was his first film. Oh, yes. We had Jim Bridges on this show, and he was saying how John did as as a personal favor to him. He did, yes. And now, uh, God willing, he'll walk off with an Academy (laughs) Award. That'll be a glorious day. Well, well, John deserves it. John has been around for so long. Yes. Uh, He's done everything. So many young actors are are not, or at least they profess not to be terribly impressed with awards. Is that important to you, Timothy? That's what makes a star, I think, to be able to receive an award to be able to receive uh, the love from those who who give it it makes you feel good inside makes you glow and i think that's why they call star a star you know Mm -hmm. Uh, i i feel good radiating you know the gift that is given to me 
makes me feel good. You've just completed a picture that uh, I hope will be opening soon in this area. It has an unusual title. It's called Brooder's Hooch. Right. It sounds like maybe it's about a bootlegger. No, 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 <laughs> I know no. it isn't. No, I play the part of Julius Brooder. And I'm a Nam veteran. And a hooch is a uh, Viet Cong bunker, underground bunker. Well, I wondered because, do you know the derivation of the word hooch? I was as, told today, yes, it's a shot of whiskey or something. Well, no, even going back farther than that, it's, oh, really? it comes from uh, an Alaskan tribe. Oh, really? Yes, that which was hoochinoo or something like that. And they made a distilled liquor, and that was called hooch because it was of their tribe. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, we, we used the word in a love scene. We, we, we called our love scene. We were doing the hoochie coo <laughs> in the hooch. <laughs> How soon will that picture be up? Hopefully this summer. Yes. What, what do you think, Timothy, is the best film job that you've done to date? It's very difficult to say, but I felt the most enjoyable experience was working with Maggie Smith and Alan Pakula in Spain two years ago. Love and pain and the whole damn thing. Love and pain and the whole damn thing, which is, uh, for me, one of, one of the most enjoyable film experiences I've. And it cuts off there. But, you know, we are working with archives, folks. So, Toppy. We, we love that lady who does those interviews. Oh, my goodness, Toppy. She had such a celebrated career. And the interview with Mr. Bottoms is one of the earliest I've seen. You should see how young she was when she did this. Now, I think that she may have only retired in the last decade. So she, like I said, had a very long and celebrated career at that station. So, well, anyways, Toppy, there are more people that came together to make this film. Tell us about the leading lady in this. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, none other than uh, Lindsay Wagner, um, the bionic woman. Uh, she played Susan Kingsfield, daughter of Professor Kingsfield. Lindsay Wagner was born in 1949. She is an American film and television actress. But more, folks, she wasn't just an actress. She was a model. She's an author. She's a singer. She's an acting coach. And uh, she is best known for her leading role in the American science fiction television series, The Bionic Woman, mm. from 76 to 78, in which she portrayed action character Jamie Summers. Now, that first role, that role uh, character started out on the series The Six Million Dollar Man. And Jamie Summers became a popular culture icon of the 70s, along with Lee Majors. For his six million dollar man and for this role wagner won an emmy award for outstanding lead actress in a dramatic role in 1977 which eh, interestingly i guess uh, first the it was the first for an actor or actress in a science fiction series science fiction wasn't taken all that seriously and Actually, nobody should take the bionic woman or the six million dollar man too seriously. Mm -hmm. But before being cast in the bionic woman, Wagner was a contract player for Universal Studios starting in 71. And she was just seen all over the place on television for universally produced television shows like Adam 12, Owen Marshall, counselor at Walt the FBI, Sarge, and Night Gallery. And in 1973, Wagner had an opportunity to branch into film roles when Universal, where she was a, uh, a, a, a contract player, cast her in a movie called Two People, and that was her first feature film and her first lead role. And then she co-starred in the 20th Century Fox film, The Paper Chase. And she did that the same year, playing the daughter of Kingsfield. Now, following the cancellation of The Bionic Woman in 78, Wagner continued to act. And her work has included the highly rated 1980 miniseries Scruples, as well as three made-for-TV bionic reunion movies with Lee Majors between 87 and 94. Woo! Oh, boy, don't... 
Ooh, look out for those. Woo. Uh, in, in 1983, uh, she also appeared in an episode of Lee Major's series, The Fall Guy. So they were reunited there as well. Also in the 80s, Wagner starred in two more weekly television series. One was called Jesse in 1984, and one was called A Peaceable Kingdom. That was in 89. Now, both of these series failed and were very short-lived uh, and canceled. Uh, but, um, gee, I remember Jesse. I don't remember a damn thing about it, but I know I watched it. Anyways, since then, Wagner has maintained a lengthy acting career in a variety of film and television productions to the present day. And you most recently would have seen her in 2015, when she appeared in an episode of NCIS season 13, a lot of her time uh, these last years, she's been an, an adjunct professor teaching uh, something about acting uh, somewhere. So she's been teaching a lot. So uh, let's find out about uh, the key player in this movie. Um, John Hausman. Oh, I'd be glad to Toppy. And let me just add a couple of lines though about Lindsay Wagner. Yeah. I, I just cannot walk by and let the poor dear sweet lady rest with those credits there. Okay. So um due in part to Lindsay Wagner as the bionic woman being on uh the sci-fi channel when it first launched, because you know, before any channel starts making their own original content, they buy libraries of these reruns so the bionic woman was featured on the sci-fi channel along with alien nation when that show first launched and due in part to her and linda carter there was probably a period in my teens where my parents possibly thought i was going to turn out straight uh, ah. <laughs> but uh just an aside um also, Lindsay Wagner in more recent years had a series of guest appearances on a show that we discussed the other year, Sci-Fi Channel's own Warehouse 13. Oh, that's right. And she played a medical doctor who was a love interest for the head of the facility there, Artie. And uh, also just an aside, that 90s uh, bionic reunion movie, well, it's also where up-and-coming actress Sandra Bullock got her start. She was going to be the new bionic girl. She was the girl in the wheelchair that they gave new legs. Oh, good Lord. Uh, yeah, I can even picture. By the way, your husband, Billy, who's in the chat room right now, says that he thought Fembox... <laughs> Fembots Go to Law School would be a perfect title of a new movie uh, with, uh, you know, anyway, self-explanatory, I guess. Fembots were, were uh, one of the villains that, that uh, Jamie Summers fought on The Bionic Woman. Anyways, why don't we get on to oh, John Hausman? Yes, and John Hausman worked with Jamie Summers Um not too long after this movie, when she did get onto the Bionic Woman, because there were some crossover episodes. There were. Yeah. So John Hausman, he played the legendary professor at Harvard, Mr. Charles W. Kingsfield Jr. So he, you know, he had a legacy. He had a title. Now, John Hausman, who was born just at the turn of the century there in 02, 1902, he lived until 88, so a little over a decade after this film came out. He had a long career. He was a Romanian-born British-American actor and producer of theater, film, and television. He became known for his highly publicized collaboration with director Orson Welles from their days in radio's Mercury Theater Productions and the Federal Theater Project. And let me just explain, uh, mm -hmm. the Federal Theater Project was something that was created along with many other uh, projects after the Depression to get people working. And, and this one, the Federal Theater Project, was to um, employ out-of-work actors. Uh, and so that, that was kind of a big deal. And uh, John Hausman played a, a major role in, in that. Okay. 
And and uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Uh, and he, and then his, his final collaboration with Orson Welles was in Citizen Kane. And then they their their well their friendship and collaborations ended over um, basically Orson Welles being pissed at Hausman for taking too much credit for Citizen Kane. Uh, anyways, uh, please continue. All right. So Hausman is also well known for his collaboration as producer of the Blue Dahlia. Oh, well, that sounds like an adult film with writer Raymond Chandler and on the screenplay for that program. Now, uh, Hausman is perhaps best known for his role as Professor Charles W. Kingsfield in The Paper Chase Tonight's this film we're discussing, for which he won the Golden Globe and an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Acting parts started pouring in for Hausman following the success of Paper Chase, and suddenly the theater and television producer was launched into an unexpected late career uh, as Hausman, the in-demand character actor, when parts started pouring in for him following the success of Paper Chase. Hausman appeared in movies like Rollerball and Three Days of the Condor, both made in 75, The Cheap Detective in 78, and John Carpenter's The Fog in 80, as well as Ghost Story in 81. Back on television, Hausman was reunited with the Paper Chase co-star Lindsay Wagner. Ooh, I teased this a little bit ago. In 76, Kill Oscar! A three-part joint episode of the popular science fiction series, The Bionic Woman and the Six Million Dollar Man. Now, th these were on different networks, folks. And he played the scientific genius, Dr. Franklin. Hausman reprised his role as Kingsfield in the 78 television series adaptation of The Paper Chase, winning two Golden Globe nominations for Best Actor in a TV Series Drama. Later in the 80s, Hausman became more widely known for his role as grandfather Edward Stratton II in Silver Spoons, where right-wing nutjob Ricky Schroeder got his child acting roots. And, uh, oh, yes, and it starred Ricky Schroeder. <laughs> Many people remember him for his TV commercials for the brokerage firm Smith Barney, which featured the catchphrase, they make money the old-fashioned way, they earn it. Let me let me just give that a whirl, uh, John Hausman style. They make money the old fashioned way. They earn it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if the camera were on you, you'd be twirling that mustache and there'd be a, a bald kid in your lap. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course, they uh, nowadays uh, we, we think they probably printed it. But anyways, also throughout the 80s, Hausman appeared in four TV miniseries, including the highly acclaimed 83 miniseries, The Winds of War, receiving a, a fourth Golden Globe nomination. Hausman later appeared in three more miniseries, A.D. in 84, Noble House in 86 and Lincoln in 86. And sadly, he passed away in 88 after a long and celebrated career. Yeah, isn't it funny? Because uh, he acted when he was very young, but then he got really into producing plays and theater. And uh, some of that later translated to early live television where he produce some live television uh, plays and things. And I just think it's amazing that I'm just going to guess, because I tried to find out, I tried to find out who uh, hired John Hausman to play Professor Kingsfield and why. And I believe that um, this is just a guess on my part, but I think the director, James Bridges, who was a screenwriter, and a director and producer like um, uh, uh, John Hausman, they knew each other. They must have known each other. And I can only think that the director said, by God, I can think of one, only one person who could play this. Let's get John Hausman. And it, it tickles me that that led to all of these, you know, acting roles for him really, you know, quite late in his life. Mm hmm. So uh, what did you think? Uh, it's a slow movie. It 
uh, there are no fist fights. There are no car chases. Uh, it's a story that takes its time being told. It's about relationships. Um, I've always found it really quite enthralling and uh, significant. I'd call it a significant movie, a significant achievement. The acting uh, by everyone is tremendous. And it does give you a bit of what perhaps it's really like for first year law students. Um, and it has a, a great story um, with a lot of, uh, of uh, other characters involved and uh, a few surprises and twists. And uh, I've always loved this movie. I, 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 it's, it's actually one of my favorite movies ever. Mm hmm. You know, I uh, having learned a bit of the history of filmmaking through the journey of our show together here, I understand that this was a time when the old Hollywood studio system had had basically been either dismantled or was going away or, or had gone. And so you get these more artistic takes on storytelling. So um, we were discussing before the show that the ending on the paper chase, it sort of is a, a fade out and they, they, um, they don't always give you all the answers. You know, many stories during this time frame wanted you to wonder what the future was going to be for these characters. And, you know, aside from that, uh, you know, it's, it certainly has the, the feel that a lot of 70s films do where, you know, it, it gives you that opportunity to wonder. Um, there were also moments during the film where I wondered because you're watching these scenes take place between Lindsay Wagner, who a little bit of a spoiler, folks, she's the teacher's daughter. I mean, the, the head honcho professor who can decide if you're going to be a lawyer or not. Well, he's he's got this pretty young thing and that's who our leading man falls for although he didn't know it at first he just is minding his own business crossing campus in the early hours of the evening and bumps into this girl and she bumps into him really I, I, that's true yes but uh you know they they have a few scenes where you're not sure if he's going to run into his professor because he t ends up being in his house. <laughs> and I actually managed to make his way down into Kingsfield study and he's walking around in his underwear, looking all at all this leather, you know, and, and the hardwood furniture and all the plaques on the wall. And he, he's, you know, starstruck really because to him, Kingsfield is just this kind of amazing son of a bitch, but he's amazing. <laughs> uh, and you just can't help. He just can't help, you know, truly admiring him and his achievements. And and uh, there's a great moment where unexpectedly Kings, Kingsfield comes back home and he's in his underwear in his study. <laughs> so that was good. And, you know, there, there's a scene also where he's sneaking out when he's come home early from a trip. The, uh, Kingsfield has come home early from a trip and he's trying to get out of the house unnoticed. And then, of course, Lindsay Wagner's character has to figure out how he's going to get his clothes to him. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, if there's some hanky panky, for lack of a better term, pun intended, going on in my house, I, I'm going to be wondering why someone is standing outside handling a bundle of clothes to someone in a car. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Kingsfield does sort of catch that part. Mm -hmm. And we don't hear what they say, but we can see from James Hart's point of view. He's looking through the window and he can see uh, Hausman uh, Kingsfield talking to his daughter. And uh, so they had some exchange. And later on, um, Lindsay Wagner tells him that 
Kingsfield just simply said, I hope it wasn't one of my law students. Because <laughs> let's face it, you know, it was it was after the 60s. And so she was a woman of the world in that time. You know, there's nothing that he could have told her that would have uh, prevented her from leading a life of liberty. <laughs> and, and this also wasn't the first time she got involved with uh, a law student and she married the first time it happened she ended up marrying uh, the law student and you know it was complicated blah 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 and they got divorced but uh, um, so yeah she's sort of trapped in this world where she's part of her father's world but she's young and pretty and you know wants a life but because of where she's living which is on campus uh, well she ends up meeting heart and uh, a relationship and she's right to the end of the movie where she brings him the letter uh, on the beach that basically says well you succeeded or you didn't you mm -hmm. you, you got you fate you you uh, passed or you failed and uh, that's the ambiguous ending they give you because before before reading it, he just simply makes the uh, envelope into a paper plane and sails it into the ocean. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> af after all that work, after those, you know, four years of, of well, I guess first year, uh, mm -hmm. really, of, of, of intensity, uh, he learns to just, you know, there's more to life than these grades. And he just sails the, the grades uh, into the ocean. I don't know about you, Toppy, but having been to a college and, you know, having lived under my parents' roof, I don't think I could have gotten away with that kind of free spirit mentality when it came to my grades because I didn't go to an Ivy League school. And I certainly knew that if I didn't perform, Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was going to be an expectation <laughs> seriously I, I this is what i believe happened after the movie fades out tim uh, uh, john hart runs into the ocean and retrieves that airplane <laughs> and gets his goddamn grades so he knows if he passed because surely uh you, you know okay eventually i'm sure he learned that he passed but mm. um uh, anyways, ah, uh. it was quite a film, and you know, Toppy, I would be remiss if I didn't point out a member of the cast that's been in something else we've discussed. This was actually probably one of his early film roles, Edward Herman, who has been in uh, many of my favorite films, including Big Business with Bette Midler and Lily Tomlin but who was also the grandfather in the Gilmore Girls that we discussed earlier in the year here. And he was one of um, James Hart's law student uh, classmates who was in his study group. Uh -huh. um, I never would have recognized him in a million years. The other actor, there's uh, two actors that are very familiar if, if you were watching anything in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the character that's in the law in the study group that smoked a pipe. Mm -hmm. I don't know who he was, but uh, he was in a lot of stuff on TV and in movies. A character actor that had appeared in a lot of stuff. The other one was James Hout Houghton, uh, who portrayed the guy that pretty much lost it. Mm -hmm. He was the he was the guy in the study group who didn't survive the year. Right. And uh, he was in a lot of television stuff, a very familiar face um, in the 70s and early 80s. Um, so, yeah. Um, would you recommend it? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, uh, it certainly would be worth comparing to other films set on a college campus because these are very impressionable years of a young person's life. And just from the standpoint of this being in the 70s, one of the opening lines of the film talks about him having his draft card. I mean, talk about pressure to perform. You know, he's going to college and wondering if he's going to be called to war. And of course, they all 
were buttoned up they were wearing sport coats and uh, bow ties just to go to class and i don't think that that's something that young people do when they go to college um, i days. can tell you uh no it isn't <laughs> um uh by the, okay can i tell you what the trend is mm. uh kids go to classes often in their pajamas and slippers <laughs> and i'm not kidding mm, uh, um, I yeah. wouldn't uh, doubt it. And Toppy, uh, yeah. you know, Toppy, there was a, a uh, another connection I wanted to mention with Lindsay Wagner. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about her being um, uh, in The Bionic Woman and um, Sandra Bullock getting her start with that. Now, did you know that Lindsay Wagner has a Star Trek connection? Here we go, folks. And All right. uh, Oh, I, well, all, I just read what Tommy Hash Brown said oh, in the chat room. You so cheated. He stole, he stole your thunder. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, uh, but tell us, tell the audience. Well, if you did not know, there was only a handful of years between Lindsay Wagner's age and the, the leading lady who won the role. But Lindsay Wagner auditioned for Captain Catherine Janeway on Star Trek Voyager in the 90s. So interesting trying to picture her i mean i think she could have pulled it off mm -hmm. um janeway or uh, uh who played janeway kate mulgrew called kate mulgrew was a little crustier so maybe mm, i don't know i don't know if wagner could have pulled that off but anyways it's really interesting picturing her in that role mm-hmm so, Toppy, we are out here close to the lobby, and this is when we talk about things that you might enjoy if you like this film, The Paper Chase. And it should be noted that it is available to view uh, on uh, Amazon Prime. It's a, a rental currently. And, uh, you know, if you if you uh, chance your way through some thrift stores, you might find a gently used copy on DVD. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, in our snack tray tonight, I'm going to recommend a film from uh, just a little over a decade from then. It was made in 86. Now, this is a film that stars the original Hot Lips Houlihan from the original MASH film in the 70s. Sally Kellerman was in this with comic legend Rodney Dangerfield. I'm going to recommend Back to School from 1986. Now, to, uh, the story of this is to help his discouraged son get through college, a fun-loving and obnoxious rich businessman decides to enter the school as a student himself. This film also is peppered with quite the cast. We have Adrian Barbeau, who was in all of those Swamp Thing movies and uh, was also um, Maude's daughter. And uh, she also had another comedy legend, Sam Kinison. And here's your other Star Trek connection, folks. Young Terry Farrell, who played Jadzia Dax on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, played the girlfriend of the, uh, the main character's son in this film. So that was one of her first movies, Back to School from 86. And more recently, um, a, a, a sort of a, a take on it with a gender swap. I don't care if you don't like her or not. Melissa McCarthy was in a film called Life of the Party, a divorcee who goes back to school and uh, happens to be the college where her daughter goes. So uh, all sorts of different twists and turns on that. But yes, back to school and Life of the Party. Okay, nice. Good choice. I'm going to recommend another movie written and directed by James Bridges. He did this one in 1977, and it's called September 30, 1955. And in this movie, we learn uh, why a small town Arkansas College undergraduate, Jimmy J, goes berserk after learning of the death of his movie idol, James Dean, who died on September 30, 1955, the title of the movie, and how he leads five of his friends to hold a vigil which turns into a drunken debauch and finally a terrible tragedy. So this is a much darker movie than Paper Chase, but it's the same kind of serious character study that he did in Paper Chase. Uh, another 
just well a, a movie that takes its time to build and it starred uh richard thomas uh of the waltons tv show and tom holtz who was in amadeus and dennis quaid and susan tyrell and this movie is also currently available on amazon prime to buy or rent september 30 1955 uh made in 1977 by james bridges okay so folks we're out here near the front door because gertie's got to catch her bus shortly but we're gonna go ahead and figure out what's coming down the pike what we're gonna discuss on our next show which will be a youtube exclusive if you want to be listening to our audio you'll have to go to our youtube channel you can actually get a link there just easily going to matinemanoush.com and look for the youtube logo but um, our next show will be on friday april 7th toppy go ahead and grab up the, the bag of coins the magician left for us yeah here you are there you go all right, here we go. Okay. Will you open that up for me, sir? All right. I'll get the capsule here. All right. Next time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next time on Bad Day Minutia, an early 2K's comedy romance featuring the love interest from the talented Mr. Ripley and Jack Black's first leading lady. A small town woman tries to achieve her goal of becoming a flight attendant starring Gwyneth Paltrow and Candace Bergen. Next time with our special guest, the fabulous Demanda Martini, we are going to talk about view from the top oh yay all right i am looking forward to that any chance to see demanda in her glory so toppy before we head on out can you look over the balcony and let us know who was in our chat room this evening yeah we do this live we do got a chat room people can participate uh, and uh, this evening we were lucky to have your hubby billy starsage our ever-present friend, Tommy Hashbrowns, uh, Janet from Another Planet. We also had Crone, the ever-mysterious Crone ha Haven. And once again, uh, from New York City, Lamont Cranston joined us. Oh, round so, of applause. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, Toppy, if you would do us the honor, say good night in the ways of the old days of radio. Good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to univospods.net, click the tower for audio. Enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. Just gone wild with Matt and Tom. Speak up. The smell cast by Toppy Smelling. Be heard. It tastes like burning with Tim and James. Unique voices in podcasting. The Shy Life Podcast with me, Paul the Shy Yeti. Univazpods.net. And, uh, you know, for those of you who were watching tonight on YouTube, no, I did not get in a fight with a stapler. I paid someone to do this to my face. But I'm bum. Okay, so we should be off of the stream. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.